Welcome to Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. Are you hungry to hear more about our beautiful Savior Jesus? Well, the Bible declares that grace and peace are multiplied to us in the knowledge of Jesus. Join me for revelatory teaching, interviews with leaders in the body of Christ, and testimonies of God's goodness in your life. Thanks for joining the conversation to reveal more of Jesus to a hurting world today. That's a case that I, I try to make profoundly, you know, that we are committed to scripture, but we're committed to spirit and they work in harmony. Mm -hmm. And we live the level of scripture. We bring our experience to the scripture, not bring our scripture down to our experience. So if there's deficiencies in our walk with God. But before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to our Christina Prayer Ministry sponsors who help support the mission to unite the body of Christ and fulfill the Great Commission with love. A big shout out to Go For Ministries, who provides all of our equipment for our gospel events. Davis Financial Services, who does all of our financial accounting. Harvest Family Network, through which I am licensed and ordained. And Life Changing Productions, who helps put together evangelistic events to reach our city for Jesus. If you or your organization are interested in becoming a CPM sponsor, you can find out more information on our website at ChristinaPereira.org. Do you have a loved one special occasion coming up and don't know what to get them? Well, now you can sponsor an episode of Revealing Jesus in their name. And you can give them a special dedication message read on air. It makes a great gift. To find out more information, just go to christinaperreira.org slash podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. I am your host, Christina, and I'm so excited to have you with me here today. I hope and I pray that you are doing well right where you are and enjoying the continuously flowing favor of grace pouring from our beautiful Savior and Father in Heaven. I've got a great show for you today. I have an amazing leader in the body of Christ with me today. He is the prayer ambassador of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, and he is the author of the new book, Pursuing God's Presence, A Practical Guide to Daily Renewal and Joy. I have with me here today, Dr. Roger Helland. Welcome to the podcast. Good morning, Christina. I'm up here in Canada in a place called Airdrie, just north of Calgary in Alberta. And that's just north of Montana. Calgary is known for 1988 Winter Olympics, as well as the largest rodeo on earth called the uh, Calgary Stampedes. We're here. It's a beautiful day. Love what's happening down in your world in Virginia and beyond. So uh, thanks for this opportunity to join you in this conversation. Oh, thank you so much for being here with me today. You know, I have to say, when I uh, began reading your book, The Presence of the Lord, and just feasting on it and sitting with him as I was reading it was just so wonderful. And I really enjoyed that. I've told our listeners a lot about you today. Can you share with them something personal, maybe just to help get to know you? Yeah, the first thing is, I was born and raised in Southern California, so I'm actually a California boy, a U.S. citizen. I got citizenship here in Canada. I married a Canadian girl who's from British Columbia um, to the West, and that's a whole other story of how I made it to Canada. But I grew up in Southern California in a non-Christian home, and I, I actually document my conversion experience in the first part of the book, but to say that really I grew up in a non-Christian family, lived in darkness, and the Lord really came and brought his light and his love into my life. I'm a Dodgers fan, just saying, and I used to surf California beaches. So that movie that came out not long ago, Jesus Revolution, really sort of stoked my uh, passion for Southern California and the beaches and all the things that happened back then. So I didn't live too far away. I grew up just uh, east of Los Angeles, about 20 miles. So still home in a lot of ways. California and the United States is in my heart. A lot of the things happening in that country. And uh, I'm paying attention to that. So with the election coming up and all the turmoil, it's quite uh, alarming. But at any rate, um, yeah. a little bit of my background. I love ice cream. 
And I love uh, Dark Girls Coffee too. And Powder Skiing. So nice. Well, I can relate to a lot of that. I love yeah. coffee, love ice cream. We're definitely yeah. an ice cream family. <laughs> now that I think about it. But yeah, that's so awesome. Well, since this is revealing Jesus, I have to, I have to ask you how you met our beautiful Savior, Jesus. Right. So, as I said, I grew up in Southern California. Basically, people ask me, what is your background? I answer it with one word, pagan. I was not a good boy. I was a really bad boy. And I got involved in all the things that young people get involved in. I won't go into a lot of the dark details to say that. Basically, my life was devoid of God and Bible. Mm -hmm church foreign jesus christ was a swear word in our family so that's how wow. I, we never had any sort of religious orientation at all until i was at a low point in my life as i think i was about almost 18 and there was a, a move of the spirit of the lord through southern california actually that the jesus revolution talks about i was kind of saved on the fringes of that at that time i was in the u.s army and I was stationed at Fort Washington, and I'd come home on Christmas leave uh, in December. And uh, a friend of mine, during the time that I was away, actually became a believer. We used to deal drugs together and, you know, party and you know, up in San Dimas, or I, sh I should say Glendora Mountain Road, where we overlooked the city where I grew up. We'd all go up there and party as high schoolers and such. And so I was stoned on LSD, believe it or not, on that Friday night as I would be my custom with my friend. And we went up there and, and he had given his life to Christ. And so I felt sort of on my own, but nevertheless, that was the space I was in. And he began to share the gospel with me while we were there. And there was an encounter with the presence of God. I think it was my first encounter where the presence of God was strong. I look back on it and I know it was the Lord and his spirit got through to my dark soul. He pierced my darkness. And I felt this tug, this gravitational pull in my heart. And I blurted out my first prayer that I'd ever prayed. And, it's, and I documented it in the book. And I, I basically say this, Jesus, if you are real, I mm -hmm. want to believe. That was my first prayer. And I left it. And nothing really dramatic happened until a couple weeks later, I was back at Fort Lewis in Washington. I was sitting in the barracks on the military base there. It was Saturday morning. It was a cold blue sky, cold morning. I was there alone, and I was reading the Bible. My stepdad, my dad, he gave me a, believe it or not, a King James Version Bible, leather-covered. It was actually a Masonic edition of all the things, and, but it was King James. Wow. And he was a Mason. God used that. And I was reading, I think it was in the Gospel of John. And I felt this inrush. I look back now and I call it my own personal Pentecost. I felt this inrush of joy and light that was just overwhelming. And the Lord visited me. And that was another encounter of his presence. And it set me on a trajectory that to this day I look back as being a defining sort of benchmark in my journey of faith to embrace Christ, and I knew that there had been a change in my life. And it was based around the gospel, the power of the gospel and personal witness, but also I would probably call it my own personal baptism in the Spirit, where I was filled to overflowing, and it was joy unspeakable. And from that point on, the Lord drew me into a commitment to follow him as his disciple. And so that's how I came to faith. Wow. Don't let anyone ever tell you that. Don't ever witness to a drunk or a person on drugs. Not ever let that be a barrier. The Holy Spirit can get through anybody at any place at any time. And he pierced my darkness and I came to faith. So that's my testimony. Mm, I love that okay. so much. Yeah. So from pagan to pastor. So I ended up becoming a pastor uh, after that and then became a prayer uh, leader and, and uh, committed to press. So that I sort of outline that. Wow. I love that so much. You said something really powerful in there that I just want to pick out real quick. You said personal Pentecost. Yes. And I was sitting here thinking, Lord, Pentecost has always meant to be a personal experience. Absolutely. 
And I thought, you know, it's so amazing because a lot of times we have these ideas of revival, but really revival is something so personal that starts in each and every one of us and it extends outward into our spheres of influence when we have that personal Pentecost. And then I love what you said. It just launched your life on a trajectory of pursuing him. You know, once we experience that presence of the Lord, there's nothing like it. We can't turn back from it. You talk about this in your book. You said it's like fully coming alive and that fullness of joy that you experience. There's nothing like it. Can you tell our listeners out there, if they've never experienced um, God's presence, can you talk about like the biblical foundation for the new covenant reality that we have now all because of Jesus? Right. So basically, I think what I try to accomplish in pursuing God's presence is a continuum of seeking his presence, of experiencing his presence, and hosting his presence. And they really work together. There's, I think, a desperate hunger and a need for people. And it really doesn't matter which tradition. We can be charismatic. We can be conservative. We can be Pentecostal or Presbyterian. We can be Baptist or we can be Brethren, whatever. There are so many traditions and denominations and faith contexts that God is not really confined to any of those. And so what I try to achieve in this book is to provide a biblical framework with personal narrative and application that I think can reach a wide spectrum of people. And I think there are times where people do actually experience his presence, but they don't have a theology for that. They don't have a framework to, to reference that, that, well, that was the experience of God. They may have a presence of God. They may have felt it was an emotional reaction to something, or it was this sort of coincidence, or, you know, we use different terms that when we experience things that we don't have a paradigm or a perspective, we have to find a way to explain it. But I think there are times where we're not only experiencing the Lord, but we're called to seek him. And so the, the primary verse that begins in the Old Testament, and again, it, it moves across the spectrum of Scripture, even into the New Testament, this whole notion of seeking his presence, we're told in Psalm 105, verse 4, and this is really the sort of the thesis of this book, the, the primary point and reference point, where the uh, writer says this, to, to seek the Lord at his strength, to seek his presence, to seek his face, literally, continually. And we know that to seek is a primary invitation and even command in Scripture. We are told to seek first his kingdom mm -hmm. and his righteousness in Matthew chapter mm -hmm. 6. We are told in Hebrews eleven six that without faith it's impossible to please God. But those who come to him must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who diligently or earnestly seek him. So there's a searching narrative throughout the Bible that we are called to seek his presence, seek his face, seek his kingdom, seek his mm -hmm. reality, really. But it takes awareness. It takes discipline. It takes a hunger. It takes an attentiveness to see how God is at work around us and in us and through us. And the Bible also tells us in Psalm 1611 that you make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. That actual verse is cited in, in Acts chapter 3, where Peter is giving a sermon and to a group of pretty hostile people. And yet he's pointing to Jesus as the one who embodies that reality that David is talking about in the psalm, that Jesus is the one who supplies us with an unlimited reservoir, the rivers of living water in our soul, in our heart, which the Bible refers to as the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So in the Old Testament, we see this hunger for the Spirit, these 
impartation of the spirit that came upon prophets and kings and certain special artists and such. But in the New Testament, we have the resident presence of God as a temple of the spirit residing in our life. However, we are invited to pursue God in such a way that not only his omnipresence, which is everywhere, like the air we breathe, but his manifest presence is to be seen, experienced, felt, and embraced in such a way that has transforming effects in our lives and in the lives of people around us. Mm -hmm. That's so good. You know, I love that you were cross-denominationally because that's something that's so powerful and something yeah. that's so after my heart because the Lord doesn't really see in denomination. He sees in body. And I believe what's coming in this coming revival and coming reformation that is coming from the heart of God is that the whole body anointing. This isn't just a charismatic thing. This isn't just a Pentecostal thing. This is a whole body anointing. And what I love about the Lord's heart is that he desires to be with us more than we could ever desire him to be with us. And so can we talk about like that theological understanding that the spirit of God, he transcends every single denomination. You talk about it in your book. Many denominations have a two thirds God. In other words, they accept the father, they accept the son, but they reject the spirit. And the truth is, is that when we do that, there are repercussions that echo throughout eternity, and we cannot afford to do that anymore. Can you talk about that? I'd love to. I spent a whole chapter talking about spirit saturation with purity and power and walking in the fullness of the spirit, which implies we actually believe that the spirit is God and that he resides in his church, the temple. I think sometimes there is this idea that the Holy Spirit is this anonymous junior member of the Trinity. In some traditions, at any rate, a lot of attention to the Father, the Son. And so some have said, well, evangelicals sometimes, they wouldn't say it, but in the practice and in the theology, we believe in Father, Son, and Holy Scripture. Yeah. But the Spirit is either neglected or minimized or you know, sort of pushed to the peripheral, although we, we would say we believe in the Spirit, and yet our practice will prove whether or not we have a full Trinitarian theology, right? right. It's not just you know, Charismatics and Pentecostals who tend to sort of, you know, showcase the Spirit and the evangelicals of the Word and Jesus and such in the Gospel, and sure, of course, but biblically, it's a Trinitarian theology, and that transcends denominations. It transcends Catholic and, and Protestant and Orthodox. And so I've, I've been privileged to have served in a number of different traditions. I was a, a vineyard pastor in Kelowna, the New Life Vineyard. Uh, we were part of the Toronto Blessing in the early days. In fact, there was a visitation of the Spirit upon us, and we were all Baptists and brethren. I mean, I went to Dallas Theological <laughs> and I was also a vineyard pastor. So I, I mentioned in my book that I learned exegesis from Dallas, but I learned the experience of the Spirit through the vineyard, through John Wimber and the whole Toronto blessing and such was, was a magnificent move that lasted 12 and a half years, actually. And there were millions of people from all over the world that came to Toronto. I just saw John actually a couple months ago, and he's 83, he's still at it. Him and Carol, they're just giving her, you know, people like Bill Johnson and Cheon and different ones that are out there that are, you know, Randy Clark and, and different ones. These are all buddies. These are all people, James Cole different ones that uh, we had a lot of intersection with. And so I've learned a, a lot uh, in my own journey of study. I was a doctoral teacher. I, I teach in different seminaries, Bible colleges, and, and there, there's a whole spectrum of people out there. I call them closet charismatics and Bapticostals. There are people in every tradition that hunger and thrive and experience the Spirit of God in ways that are dramatic. And uh, visions and dreams and the prophetic and, and miracles and healing and all the rest of it. And so my heart, as I've tried to convey in this book, is to invite people to explore full-on Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and Son, equal in perfection, in purity, in power, and in holiness, and in magnificence. And he offers the gifts, he offers the power, he offers 
purity and holiness and, and the vitality of the Godhead is resident in the Spirit. Jesus sent the Spirit. The book of Acts, the book of Luke, really depict the carrying on of the Spirit after Jesus went to heaven and sent his Spirit to carry on his work. So I think most scholars believe that and write about that, but to practice it is another thing. And so surrender, having faith, trusting the Spirit to have his way, letting go of control, these are the kinds of things that a lot of people face in various traditions. But mm -hmm. uh, but there, like you mentioned, there, there's sort of a global movement of uh, a hunger and a cry for revival. So maybe a little later we could talk about what's happened at Asbury University, which I think is sort of a reference point of kind of ingredients that really open up those channels of receptivity to a visitation of the presence of God. That's the prevailing theme that's out there. It's in yes. music and teaching. That hunger for the presence of God transcends denominations. It's biblical, it's central, and I invite your listeners to develop a posture of seeking the presence of the Lord and then hosting His presence. Mm -hmm. That's so good. I think you hit the nail on the head, and I think we have to have the visitation with the habitation. Because oh, yeah. now in the New Covenant, what we have what Jesus has brought us into, we now have access to that habitation of God. Just like David, when he went out and he brought the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, back to the city to build a temple for it. But we have to value it. We have to enjoy it. We have to own it and realize that it's, you know, sometimes we can get really religious about the presence of God, but we have to remember at the forefront of the presence of God is relationship. And, you know, when we relate with the, the Father, we relate with the Son, we relate with the Spirit. In that context of relationship, we become the kavod, the habitators of God, because it's just like a good father. It's just like a good friend, just like a good brother that is always present. Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And he says, it's better for you that I go away because the Father will send the Spirit. And so, you know, you talked about a couple of testimonies from some pastors and leaders who were leading without the presence of the Holy Spirit and kind of what they went through, like trying to labor in ministry without the empowering presence of the Spirit and how their lives changed when they encountered it. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so Francis Chan is one of the world-class leaders who's had a magnificent alteration in his own life. He has, even now, embraced the charismatic stream in ways that he used to be opposed to, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, he was a Dallas crowd, as I was. I mean, he was to, still as a Bible preacher. He led a big church in Southern California. He left that several years ago. He's been more itinerant. He's done a lot of work in Hong Kong and in San Francisco and, and written a whole number of different books. I mean, in 2009, he wrote The Forgotten God, which basically is trying to, you know, revitalize the theology of the Spirit, primarily for conservatives that he's writing to. There's a missing ingredient, The mm -hmm. Forgotten God, you know, the missing we're sort of the Godhead in our theology. So here's Francis Chan touching the fringes of this dynamic, what we're talking about. But he has had, and you can go on YouTube and, and see him actually tell his own testimonies of his encounters with the Spirit, even with tongues and things like that. Where before he was sort of like, and I wouldn't say he was at the same level as the Apostle Paul was before when he persecuted the church. Well, you know what I'm saying? There was an encounter with the Lord that shifted his theology. I mean, yeah. he hobnobbing with people like Mike Nickel. He's with Randy Clark in Tulsa, Oklahoma in August in their Global Awakening Conference. I think it's April or August 2 to 5 or whatever. So, and he's been in, in Kansas City with Mike Pickle. He was speaking at his conference differently. All that to say, he is bringing a biblical framework that's wedded to the Spirit. So that's a case that I, I try to make profoundly, you know, that we are committed to Scripture, but we're committed to Spirit, and they work in harmony. Mm -hmm. And we live the Bible of Scripture. We bring our experience to the Scripture, not 
bring our scripture down to our experience. So if there's deficiencies in our walk with God, by faith, when we embrace the Spirit and it's oriented by scripture, we get the content, but then we get the dynamic, the, the effusion of power. And trying to lead a church without the presence of God it is a tough go. You know, a lot of our churches are not growing. They're, they're not flourishing. There's not the vitality. There, there's a lot of sermons and singing, but there isn't necessarily a seeking of presence, right, as mm-hmm. a preeminent focal point. You mentioned the word kavod. I'm glad you actually pronounced it right. It's the Hebrew. Often it's pronounced kavod, you know, but it's actually kavod. And it's this wonderful world word that captures who God is in all his magnificence, his perfections, his holiness. We translate it as glory. That's mm-hmm. the best to come up with. It's like shalom. It's hard to translate shalom. We translate it mm-hmm. as peace, but it's like heaven on earth. The, the shalom of God is heaven on earth, all the beauty and the bounty, the fruitfulness, and the lack of tension. But kavod is the manifest glory of God resident with his people. It's the weight of his presence. And I, the habitation, I love the way you put that. There's visitation, which happens, but he wants to have a habitation. And so I, I actually spent a whole chapter talking about the habitation of Kavod, which is the church. It's to be the place of his presence. We are the glory carriers, the people of his presence. And when things happen in, in our gatherings, we're invited to experience his presence in a way that is compelling, not just sermons and singing, but mm-hmm. there is spirit, there's sacrament, there's miracles, there's healing, there's prophecy. Mm-hmm. There is encounters with God that are hard to put into words. Yeah. Uh, people, you know, revival, renewal encounters, we can see. But even things like what happened at Asbury, that that was a habitation for that mm-hmm. three-week period. I mean, they had to shut it down because they had to run the university. But from February 8th to the 23rd, there was a habitation of Kavod. There were thousands of people from all over the world coming to Wilmore, Kentucky to experience his presence, lining up outside for six hours in the freezing February winter cold. Why? Because of his presence. Mm-hmm. It wasn't preaching or singing. It's average. You can look at it on YouTube. The presence of God is not average. Jesus longs to encounter you and transform your life. If you're feeling the lack of God's presence or believing for breakthroughs, you are invited to partake of the Holy Communion. I've got a great resource for you, the Lord's Supper, our promised place of intimacy and transformation with Jesus. Written by theologian Jonathan Black, invites you to partake in Christ's feast in his new book. With warmth and depth, Jonathan explores how Jesus' invitation to participate in communion is a call to partake in his promises of presence, healing, forgiveness, glory, victory, and intimacy. Christ's table is still a powerful, life-changing place of transformation. And just for being a Revealing Jesus listener, you get 40% off and free shipping with promo code REVEALINGJESUS at familyownedbakerbookhouse.com. So pick up a copy today and experience the Lord Jesus' presence in a new way. Just head to the link in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always tell the Lord, if you ever need to just cut my preaching short and knock me out for the glory to come, then just let it happen. That's what I want. That's what I want. You know, I've been having these conversations with the Lord just recently, really thinking about what I want. And what I want more than anything is for his people to have an experience with him. All of these podcasts and things, and we prayed before we started, and we invited the Lord into it to lead it. Every single moment that we are on this earth is a potential interaction with the God of heaven when we host his presence. And the thing is, is that there are people out there who are depending on it, like they are depending on air and water to breathe. And without it, like I said, there are repercussions that will echo throughout eternity. And me and my heart, as a follower of Christ, the only posture that I have and that I believe that each one of us can have is a posture of surrender. Because Mm -hmm. you cannot control him. He will not be controlled. And he will not be shoved into a box, a manifestation of which you think is appropriate. 
or anyone deems is appropriate. But he is who he is, and he will do what he will do, because he is God. And he searches the heart of God. He searches the heart of the Father. He searches the heart of Jesus and what he wants to bring into this world. And our only, only stance is to surrender and honor him. I spend an entire chapter on pursuing the holiness of God. In fact, I'm speaking at a church this Sunday. It's actually a book launch time of year. Well, people could be coming here in Airdrie. It's a very spirit-filled, spirit-engaged, presence-centered church that has invited me to, to speak. And my topic is going to be pursuing holiness because and this is part of the, sort of the dilemma with people who want to seek the presence of God is, is often there's power that's in mind. Let's seek the, God, the, the power of God. And I'm all for that. But I think biblically, there's a corresponding dimension that when we seek God's presence, we are seeking his holiness. Mm -hmm. When we encounter his kavod, we encounter holiness. Mm -hmm. And in Hebrews 12, 14, it says this, pursue peace with all people and holiness. It's the same verb that governs both of those objects. Mm -hmm. We simultaneously strive for, chase after, that's what that Greek word means, peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see God. So purity enhances mm -hmm. perception. So when we pursue God, we are inviting his holiness into our life, and he will transform us from the inside out through the character of Christ-likeness in our lives. And so revival and renewal, at the heart of it, is holiness. In fact, one of the pictures that I love around Asbury, and I'm going to be showing this on Sunday, is this student has got his hands held wide open. He's facing the front of the Hughes Auditorium in Asbury. And it says, holiness unto the Lord up above the stage. Wow. That, for me, is the picture that captures that whole habitation of the kavod of God. It's holiness unto the Lord. There's consecration. There's repentance. There's confession. There's healing. There's transformation. The testimonies that came out of there were profound. The other thing that came out of Asbury is that there was a thousand people that came to faith. I don't know if people know that, but we had one of our Billy Graham senior leaders here in Canada interview Mark or Zach McCreeves. He's the chapel speaker on February the 8th. Interviewed him for an hour on a podcast. And one of the things that he told Mark is that they have documented a thousand people came to faith during that three-week period. And how does that happen? It doesn't happen by good evangelistic messages or good worship or speakers or whatever. They didn't have that. It was right. a presence of God that was so strong, but at the core of it was holiness. Holiness is attractive. It's beautiful. It's compelling. It, it is God's kavod captured in his essence of who he is. He radiates holiness. And John Wesley taught that the neglect of prayer is a grand hindrance to holiness. So prayer and revival and renewal and pursuing God's presence is the central practice by which we enter his presence, seek his presence, hold his presence, experience his presence, and the transforming effects. I love your heart and the heart of all your listeners right now. I'm hoping that their hearts are being sort of tugged on and they're feeling the presence of the Lord right where they're at. Yes, me too. Me too. Yeah. I'm feeling it. <laughs> Well, this has been so good. Is there anything burning on your heart that you'd like to say directly to our listeners today? I want to say this about the United States. So we're here in Canada. Canada and the U.S. are very, very different countries, very different government structure and policy and social issues and such. Canada is a very secular country. It's a pluralistic it, as a very liberal form of government and, and a lot of trouble between East and West and our indigenous peoples and, and such. And, you know, it's a very different country. When I look at the United States and the complexity of the 50 states and what's happening right now with uh, the indictments for the, the former president, the, the incredible polarization between the Republicans and Democrats and, and the very various regional disputes, you know, in places like Florida, California, Texas, and other states. It really grieves my heart because the United States and the American dream and, and you know, 
mom's apple pie and, and Chevrolet and sort of the, these images, you know, father knows best. And, and, and there's, there's a lot of beauty and diversity within uh, the U.S. Uh, across the country. And yet there is a desperate need for an outbreak of the Holy Spirit yes. that will penetrate the division, the hostility, the, the political ideology, the incredible disruption. I mean, COVID brought enormous disruption that's it's still with us, you know, the division over government policy and masking and vaccines and such. It just sort of accentuated some of the divisions that were already there. Mm -hmm. And we can vote in the right people and the right government and the right senators and, and House of Representatives and such and local leaders. But at the end of the day, righteousness exalts a nation. Mm -hmm. So my only sort of including exhortation is, and I, I actually cover this in, in my last chapter where I talk about presence-centered mission and justice. Mm -hmm. And the United States has had revivals, you know, the outpourings of the Spirit that altered our culture, altered our society in dramatic ways. And we are on the precipice of falling into a chasm of darkness mm -hmm. or appealing and calling out for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God that will just envelop the 50 states of the United States and turn the country around from, from a, a path that is a path of destruction. I love our country. Again, I grew up in Southern California, so, you know, you can take the boy out of California, but you can't take the California out of the boy. But California has become a very, very liberal state. And yet there are a lot of great people all over, great churches, great inputs. And we just want to see the Lord inhabit the United States of America yes. with his presence. With his yes. presence. So people of God out there, pray for the presence of God to permeate your church your community, your state, and your country. That's my exhortation from someone who's up in Canada looking down south and seeing what's going on. Oh, yeah. Thank I don't you. want to turn on the news every time. Oh, my goodness, the gun issues and people getting shot in schools and theaters. is like, oh, my goodness, when is it going to stop? Oh, Lord. Wow. I know. I know. And, you know, as, wow. as someone who is called to this nation, I have never done more weeping and interceding in my life as I have done for the last eight years yeah. for the body of Christ and for this nation. I just really feel Lord to sh led to share this really quick. I was having a conversation with the Lord over all of these things, and I was weeping over the body of Christ. And I said, Lord, I felt like the situation and all of these people, all of this made it possible to say things that were so ugly and hateful. And I said to the Lord, why did you allow this? And he said to me, everything that came out of them was already in them. Wow. And I wept even more. Oh, that's in trouble. He said this to me. He said, they wanted a king. I gave them a king they never want. And he said this to me. He said, every time they prayed for it to be revealed, I revealed more of what was already inside of them. And so I want to say this very clearly. The body of Christ needs to repent for what has come out of their mouths and for what has been in their hearts. Because God is wanting to show great amounts of mercy on this nation. But he wants to do it through his body. We are to be known as a people of mercy and kindness and love and respect and honor for one another. The Bible says this, you will know that they are my disciples indeed by the love that they have for one another. And I believe that God still has hope because this was his idea. The body of Christ, the ecclesia, the church was his idea. And he still has hope. So therefore, I have hope. 
And, you know, I shared this with you earlier. We've actually started working on doing a big revival evangelistic outreach here in Richmond. But the Lord said this to me. He said, I want you to build it around the presence of God because I'm going to unite their hearts together in such a supernatural way that they can carry what I'm about to pour out. But it's not going to happen unless we unite around the person of Jesus. There's one king, there's a king in the kingdom, and his name is Jesus. And we need to get that abundantly clear. And we must unite around the third person of the Trinity and allow him to do what he wants to do. He is God. And we need to respect and honor him for that. And so, you know, we've started revival meetings for leaders here in RBA. And we've invited all different denominations into it because the Lord wants to unite our hearts together in such a supernatural way. It's only going to happen through what Jesus has done coming into that revelation. It says, it's not male or female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. All are one in Christ. And we need to see that. And we need to honor that. And it doesn't mean that we all agree on everything. But it does mean we agree on the basics. Jesus is Lord. He is our Savior. He is risen from the dead. He died for our sins. You know, we need to agree on that stuff. But all of the peripheral things, what's important is that we move with the heart of the Lord. And I say this on the podcast, we don't have time to play church anymore. There are people who are actually dying and going to hell because we choose to fight amongst ourselves. And it's not okay. Sorry. <laughs> I don't typically preach on here, especially not with my guests. <laughs> wow. I'm exhorted deeply. Can you repeat that first little sentence thing that you said that the Lord put into your heart about? We speak out what's inside. What's that? I want to get yes. that exactly right. Yes. He said to me, everything that came out of them was what was already in them. Do you remember that scripture? When Jesus was speaking with the Pharisees and he was saying, you think that you clean, you know, the outside of the cup, but you need to clean the inside of the cup. And it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. And that's it right there. Everything that came out of them is already in them. It was already what was in them. Yeah. It was already what was in them. Yeah. I wish I could get that in my book. Huh? Written in a revised copy, Christina, and I'll footnote you on that. That is profound because it's like the outside of the cup. You know, the inside is dirty. The outside is kind of the whitewashed. Yes. Sepulchre. It's kind of more of the dramatic version of this. But wow, what's inside what was already inside. Everything that came out was already in there. I got to ponder that. Yeah, it was, you know, honestly, like I wept even more after he said that. No. Because. No. Yeah, then. I knew then that this wasn't just this person came in and made it acceptable. This was like a deeply rooted issue that's been there for a very long time. No, you are right. Because the Bible lets you know out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Yes. So yes. when Isaiah has this picture of God's holy, holy, and holy, holy is the God Almighty. And he goes, I'm a man of unclean lips, right? And, and, and so the, the angels yeah. come down and sort of cauterize his lips. There's a cleansing. And I talk about this a little bit because this holiness factor really is the holiness of the heart. And if yeah. I've got contamination in my heart, it's going to come out in my speech. It's going to come out in my actions. Yeah. And it's interesting that the imperative for holiness is preceded by peace with all people. It says to strive for peace with all people and holiness. It's one verb governs both objects. So it's a, stri it's a present tense striving after peace. If we don't have peace, if we have hostility and, and polarization and, and sort of a, a militant, ungracious approach, I would go to the wall and say that reflects a lack of holiness mm -hmm. and a lack of the presence of the Spirit yes. in our life. One of the, as you know, prevailing characteristics of the Spirit of life is peace, love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. And when the presence of the Lord prevails, 
in our lives, in our churches, in our homes. I talk about home-based holiness. In our workplaces, I talk about God at work. So he's at work in our workplaces, and are we glory carries of his presence, that we are hosting his presence, that we have the radiance of his kavod emanating forth from our lives, from our conversation or conduct with those around us. And I think you're absolutely on to something here, the way you put this. And I'm personalizing. I'm not just talking about for your listeners or for the readers of my book. I'm talking about me. Yeah. What, what comes out of my mouth? How do I talk to my wife? How do I talk to my children and grandchildren? How do I talk to my colleagues and people? And you know, what kind of postings do I do on Facebook and online and such? You know, when there's presence of God prevailing in our lives, these things become transformed into Christ-likeness, where there's holiness, humility, godly character, goodness, righteousness, patience, all these attributes. Of God. Wow. And that is the outcome of the presence of God. Yes, absolutely. There's purity. Absolutely. So good. Well, I feel like we could just keep going on and on and on. But would you pray for our listeners today that they can experience not only a visitation, but a habitation? Yes. Yeah. Would you like me to pray? Yes, please. So all you dear listeners, whatever city, whatever state, even whatever country you are in, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate that you have taken the time to listen in on this conversation. I wish we could all be in one room together, mm -hmm. but we thank God for the technology. And I want to ask each of you out there to put your hand on your heart. Just physically even put your hand on. And I have people do this when church services, and there are things that happen. I just believe in impartation. Lord, I'm praying now for each of these dear men and women, boys and girls, young and old, who want a touch of your spirit, who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Lord, that our souls are thirsty like a deer pants for water, our soul longs for you. Lord, that our hearts long to experience your presence in ways that transform us from the inside out. Yes. Oh, Lord, may the heat even be radiated through our own hands and into our own heart. Lord, there are documented cases of that, even in my own life and others, where the, even the heat of your presence is a physical manifestation where you say yes, and you manifest yourself in ways that are even physical and tangible. Lord, not that we're looking for a phenomenon. No, Lord, we're wanting to be attentive to the very specific ways, even tangible ways that you speak and minister to us. And I'm praying for each of your listeners, all of those of you out there, if you need healing, that the Lord would heal your body, would heal your mind, your soul, your spirit, whatever it is where you have an infirmity or a difficulty, depression, anxiety, whatever. I'm praying for a release of the Holy Spirit deeply right now as you put your hand on your heart that the anointing of the Spirit would be with you, he'd minister to you, he would encourage you and guide you, that you would seek his presence as a, a prominent posture in your life each day, each moment. You become aware of his presence around you each day, around you, uh, in you, through you, at work, at, in your home, uh, in your community, in your church. Every one of us would be uh, mindful that we are glory carriers. We carry the glory of God in us and around us. Lord, may you have your way. May we surrender in advance by faith. May we seek your presence and, and, and your strength. Lord, may we seek your face continually. And Lord, that there are pleasures forevermore at your right hand and fullness of joy. I pray for that. I pray for a release of an impartation of your grace and your goodness for these dear listeners. Yes, Lord. Pursue the presence of God and the pleroma, the fullness of God would fill them up to overflowing, that they flow and rest and experience personal renewal. And Lord, I'm praying for all these churches that everyone is a part of, that there would be revitalization and renewal and revival in those churches and in those communities as habitations of the glory of the presence of God. I pray for Christina, for all her work, for her blog and her work in, in, in her city of Raleigh and other places around the world where there's influence. May it go far and wide, exponentially, viral, the presence of God, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much for praying. Thank you so much for being here with me today. This has been so fun. I have enjoyed the opportunity and the privilege and the honor. And we bless you and all your listeners. Thank you so much. Well, I hope and I pray today's episode has blessed you as well. I will have links from today's podcast and resources in the show notes on cpnshows.com under Revealing Jesus with Christina Prayer or wherever you get your podcasts. There you'll find additional resources to connect with us and our special guest, Dr. Roger Ellen. And don't forget to pick up a copy of his new book, Pursuing God's Presence, a practical guide to daily renewal and joy. Until next week, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. I hope today's episode has blessed you. Please subscribe, share it with your friends, and don't forget to sign up for our ministry mailing list for more encouraging content about our beautiful Savior, Jesus. Just text JESUS to 1-833-815-7778. That's 1-833-815-7778. Seven 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 eight, And of course, it's your turn now to join the conversation. Send me your burning questions, leaders you would like to hear from in the body of Christ, your testimonies, and more. Just click join the conversation in the show notes. And for more information about our ministry, visit us at ChristinaPereira.org. Until next week, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless.